Let right. me ask you the bigger question, and that's yeah. just, can the church err yeah. And, yeah. and teach heresy at all? Because a lot of people, I mean, you see mm -hmm. big name podcasts out there. Is the Pope a heretic? The Pope is a heretic. Uh, mm -hmm. Has the Pope mm -hmm. broken with uh, the church? Is there a rupture in the church? And that's really out there. That's what's filling mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the airwaves. That's the narrative that's catching on. Can the church teach heresy? And can mm. the Pope teach heresy? Yeah, so there, there's multiple distinctions I want to make here because f first you mentioned, um, can the church err? And then you also mentioned, can it teach heresy? And then you mentioned, um, can the Pope be a heretic? There, so there's multiple distinctions I want to make here. Number, number one, um, I, I would say not, er not all error is of the grade of heresy. Um, obviously, whenever we, we speak of those first paragraph teachings, we cannot speak of error. Those are infallible. The very definition of infallible is it's without error, right? So obviously, we're not talking about first paragraph teachings. Those are free from error. Um, we're also not talking about second paragraph teachings, secondary objects, because those are also infallibly taught. So those are free from error. Now, that third category, the non-definitive teachings, can we speak of error here? Yes. And I would say uh, of a certain kind. Um, not of the degree of heresy, but of a lower grade. And the reason why I want to say, yes, we can speak of error in third paragraph teachings is because if you speak of non-definitive teachings or reformable teachings, by definition, that could be erroneous, right? by definition. Otherwise, everything's definitive. You, you wouldn't even have this third paragraph teachings if, if they're all infallible already. So clearly we're talking about non-infallible teachings. As soon as you open that door, you're already admitting Yes, you could have error here. Uh, now, whether or not we do have error in any of these teachings is a different question, but could you potentially have error here? Yes. But I want to say of a very low grade, not of the grade of heresy. Not all error is the exact same thing. Some things could be so erroneous that they're heretical, they're contrary to a dogma. Other things could be very, 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 very low in the spectrum as far as a propositional error, like the proposition itself is mistaken. It could be very, very low. Um, maybe, maybe some of the ecological uh, teachings of, of the Pope could be, the proposition could be false, and we could speak of it in error in that sense, but we wouldn't speak of it as necessarily heresy, as being contrary to a dogma. So again, I want to recognize grades here when we speak of air and make a distinction. I admit very low levels of air to these third paragraph teachings, but not heresy. And why am I saying not heresy? That is contrary to a dogma. Why am I saying that? Um, there is enough evidence from what the magisterium has said about itself in both the pre-conciliar era and the post-conciliar era. And not only what the magisterium has, has said, but also the consensus of theologians. There's enough evidence where they've indicated the church couldn't teach heresy, even non-definitively, even in that non-definitive capacity. The reason why is heresy destroys your soul if, if you assent to it. How is it that the church could authoritatively, though non-definitively, but still bind consciences to embrace something that's soul-destroying? That doesn't make any sense whenever we read magisterial documents that speak of the protection of the Holy Spirit for the entire magisterium, not just definitive teachings, not just infallible ex cathedra teachings, but a, a protection of the Holy Spirit for the entire magisterium. Now, how can we speak of the protection of the Holy Spirit for non-definitive teachings if we can admit error? Well, we're not saying that the Holy Spirit is protecting the proposition, the truth of the proposition of a non-definitive teaching. That's, we already admitted error. But what we're saying is that there would be a safety there. Like it wouldn't be such a grade that, of error that if I were to embrace it, it's soul destroying. Not all error is, is the same. There, there are certain errors that would not be soul destroying. For example, two plus two equals five. That's an error, it's a propositional error. But if I embrace that, that doesn't destroy my soul. But if I embrace the heresy that same-sex acts are morally good, that, that could certainly be soul destroying, right? Yeah, Not it all is air, for a great many yeah, people. Yeah, right, right. With, with full knowledge, full consent, absolutely. Um, so that, that would then be a mortal sin. That would be soul destroying. Um, you can't, so that, that's why I want to say not all error is created equal. Not all sure. errors are the same. Uh, some things could be erroneous propositionally, but not then soul destroying. And then some could be very much so soul destroying. Um, and to so, your point, that seems like that's what Christ is saying when he says, you know, if you reject the magisterium, you reject me. If you reject the apostles, you reject this me. Is he can't say that and then be like, 
well, here's a magisterium that errs in something that's soul destroying, and then mm -hmm. it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't proposition. This is important. And by the way, it also pertains not only to the teachings of the church, but also the prudential judgments. The Holy Spirit is protecting them from being a judgment that's so detrimental that would be soul destroying. Like the church can't promulgate a missile that would be soul destroying. That, that would completely undermine its very mission to sanctify the church. Um, and again, we're talking about on a, on a universal level. Like you could have things that happen on a local level that, that could be soul destroying, but on the universal level, no. Um, but, but you mentioned something important there because this is what Humani Generis, Pius XII actually says. He says about papal encyclicals, so he's talking about those non-definitive teachings. He's not talking about ex cathedra. He's not talking about infallible teachings. He's talking about non-definitive teachings, non-infallible teachings of a pope in an encyclical. He says of them in Humani Generis, he says, those teachings embody what Jesus said when he said, he who hears you hears me. He who doesn't hear you rejects me and him who sent me. He applies those words to non-definitive teachings. So in other words, if I were to just dismiss a non-definitive teaching, oh, it's not infallible, therefore I could just outright dismiss it. I'm dismissing Christ according to Pius XII, because it's, it's those teachings too that are included in this concept of he who hears you hears me, because they're authoritatively taught. Um, so if, if we can speak of the voice of Christ being present in these non-definitive teachings, we can't say it's the voice of Christ insofar as it ensures the truthfulness of each proposition, but we could at least say it's the voice of Christ insofar as he's going to ensure that it wouldn't be something soul destroying. So when we look throughout what the church has said about itself in the teaching office, there's many instances that it would indicate, okay, there's still going to be a safety to these non-definitive teachings. They may not always be true, but there's still a safety to them. They could never be something that would harm one's soul. And that's the error of today. There are many people who think they're guardians of tradition and that they're traditional. And in fact, they're anything but that because they're rejecting the very teaching authority that of which it said, he who hears you hears me. And they think that they can do that because it's not ex cathedra. It's not infallibly taught. Well, sure. And, that's and then an it's error. like, if the church admits, if the church tells us that mm -hmm. there can be, um, you know, these are not, irreformable teachings at a certain level, then it's like, why aren't you listening to the church? You claim you're leaving the, the church in the name of listening to the church when your mm -hmm. leaving is a product of your not listening. It's a logical mm -hmm. contradiction, of course, as all error and sin is. Now, there is an important qualification I want to make here because it, it does need to be said. The document Donum Veritatis, which is a magisterial document, it does note there are very rare cases where a well-trained theologian, for very good reasons, could suspend, not, that's not the same as dissent, but could suspend a scent of intellect and will to a non-definitive teaching. Sure, and that's that a is CDF very, document. Yes, and that is such a rare circumstance. The vast majority of instances does not meet that description for well, multiple and Donum, reasons. Donum Veritatis says, according to that person's training also. So you have a yeah. bunch of internet theologians who think that, yeah. you know, uh, because they like to read an encyclical on the side, then they can take mm -hmm. a public stance against the church. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's, it's silliness. It is. And, and I would say the only instance in which a theologian could even suspend that is if they're under the impression that the magisterium has already taught something to the contrary with a higher degree of authority, because then their assent would already be bound to that one with a higher degree of authority, as opposed to at the lower degree of authority that is an opposing proposition. That would be the only instance that I think a well-trained theologian could suspend judgment. And that's incredibly rare if, if it has even happened. I challenge the question whether or not there have been any errors in the non-definitive teachings of the church. I already challenge that. I don't concede that there have been any. If there have been, they're so rare. Um, it's not like this is just happening all over the place. Um, but I do at least admit that there, there could be the possibility of it. But that's such a rare circumstance, right? I mean, but most of us, aren't doing that. We're just outright rejecting Vatican II's non-definitive teachings or anything that the Pope says that may be authoritative, but it's not ex cathedra. We're just rejecting it and saying, ah, I don't have to accept it. It's not ex cathedra. Or, ah, I don't have to accept anything of Vatican II because it didn't offer any solemn dogmatic definitions. Right. Which and creates a, another problem because a lot of people then are under the impression that means there's no infallible teachings of Vatican II. Of course, right. Um, which 
there's no anathemas in Vatican II. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Pope Paul VI talks about this. But there is doctrine that's taught in Vatican II. Mm-hmm. It's not th- this whole canard of, oh, it's, a, it's only a, a disciplinary council. It's not a doctrinal council. That's actually contradicted by John the Twenty Third in the document that he, you know, mm-hmm. drafted yep. that starts the council out. So yep. it's a silly, silly canard. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and pastoral is not necessarily opposed to doctrinal. I mean, th- those are not mutually exclusive. So some people end up confusing those two and they think, well, if it's a pastoral council, therefore nothing is doctrinal. And that's, that's not this, at all what is meant by pastoral here. But um, what you do find within Vatican II are second and third level teachings. Sure. And that may come as a surprise to some, because again, remember those second level, those secondary objects are infallible teachings. Some people think there's no infallible teachings in Vatican II. That's not true. Lumen Gentium, paragraph 21, on the sacramentality of the episcopate is a classic example. Prior to Vatican II, the question of the sacramentality of the episcopate, whether or not the episcopate is of a higher grade sacramentally um, in the sacrament of holy orders than the priesthood, that was in debate. At Vatican II, Vatican II, they settled it and said, yes, the episcopate is a higher grade of the sacrament of holy orders than the priesthood. It's not that the priest is just some glorified administrative priest. I'm sorry, it's not that the bishop is just some glorified priest with um, jurisdiction and administration. No, it's, it's a higher degree. It's the fullest degree of the sacrament of holy orders. That's definitively settled at Vatican II. But it's a secondary object of infallibility. And some people get tripped up because they see Paul VI spoke about no new solemn dogmas. But you remember dogmas are primary objects, the things revealed by God. Well, that's true. But what about definitive Catholic doctrine, secondary objects? Paul, Paul VI doesn't comment on that in that quote. But he does mention elsewhere in the Acts of Vatican II, I think it's the beginning of the third session, he mentions Lumen Gentium is going to settle this issue on the sacramentality of the Episcopate in a way that can no longer be questioned. And that's why a lot of theologians say, yes, this was definitively settled. So you do have infallible teachings. It's just a secondary object, not a dogma. Sure. But you're not free to oppose it because it is infallible. But then the vast majority of teachings in Vatican II, they're not that first or second level. They're, they're going to be that third level. But they're in the highest part of that spectrum. They're, they're incredibly authoritative and weighty. You don't have the option to just say, I can dismiss it because it's not definitive. No, you have that obligation to assent with intellect and will because, again, he who hears you hears me. Michael, we are running up against the clock, unfortunately. Um, I just wanted to get you to quickly weigh in on that last question. What about the Pope when he is, oh, yeah. uh, you know, speaking about like mm-hmm. offhand mm-hmm. as maybe a private theologian? Oh, yeah. maybe hell doesn't exist. Maybe this, maybe that. Maybe it was yeah. just uh, sharing the miracle of the loaves and fishes. It, what do you say mm-hmm. to that? Very quick. Yeah, the, the question of wh- whether or not the Pope could be a heretic, right? So I think we established in his teachings, in his teaching office, in that capacity, he cannot be a heretic. However, could he, as a private person, be a heretic? I do think that that is possible. And could he then utter those heresies publicly in an, in, in an interview or something on an airplane? And it's, it's not authoritative. It's not part of his magisterium. So it's not protected by the Holy Spirit. But, you know, he, he utters it. And pub- publicly. I think that that is possible. Um, so, but whether or not that's possible doesn't necessarily mean that it has happened. We could discuss whether or not Pope Francis has ever done this, for, for instance, but could Pope Francis utter something that is heretical, not as the Pope, but just as a private individual? Yeah, I do think that that is possible. And, and no, he would not automatically lose office, by the way.